Well, thank you all for your comments following the video that I put up about my indoor HF antenna system. I was actually on the radio this morning. I put a call out on 12 metres and someone in North Carolina came back to me. So it shows what's possible with such a simple system, although conditions are quite good. One thing I didn't point out was that these elements, they're made from 20 amp 12 volt installation cable. Uh, so this is the sort of cable you would use for doing a, a radio installation in a car. I'm not sure if that makes any difference or not, but it just happened to be what I had available at the time. And you can see that one of them is red because I used, I split the red and black sides. In that video, I pointed out that I had put a line isolator at the radio end of this coax. What a line isolator does is it stops common mode currents coming back down the outer of the cable. With these elements being quite close to the coax, some of that's going to be induced in here and end up coming down into the radio. So you could end up with a hot chassis. Back in my early days, I used long wire antennas and I didn't use ballons at feed points and things like that. And you would end up with hot chassis. So sometimes the radio would, you get an RF burn from the radio or even from a metal cased disc microphone. So you have to be quite careful. A line isolator stops that happening. The other thing that it does is it stops any interference from domestic appliances, house wiring or anything else being picked up on the coax and being sent back into the receiver. So for me, it was quite an important thing. Now, I did have a commercial one and the commercial one consisted of two Type 43 toroids which was tightly wound with very thin coax cable and it was attached to two SO239 sockets and I attached that to the radio with patch leads. I didn't find it to be terribly effective and I was also concerned that there could be losses through that very thin cable, possibly some heat build up in the cores. Then it stopped working and what it turned out to be was that the thin coax had fractured at the point where it went into the SO239 and there was no excess there for me to be able to reattach and I thought well I could put an extra bit of wire in there or something it's going to become quite difficult to fix that. So at that point I thought I'm going to look around for some other alternatives. Now the normal way that you make a choke is to take a Type 43 toroid and loosely wind some coax cable on it and it's got to be RG58 because it's the only thing thin enough. I didn't think that that sort of loose winding would give enough connection to the to the core to be an effective choke or not to the same level of effect that I need for the interference that's coming down the outer of the coax. The other thing I thought was if I wind it tightly, I'm going to end up changing the characteristic impedance of the coax because I'm going to have lots of right angle turns in there and the coax itself isn't rated to be turned that tightly. So I went looking for commercial alternatives to the one that had broken and MFJ made one which had SO239s on each end. But when I went looking for prices for this, I found an article written by someone who'd taken one apart. And what they'd found was that there was a length of coax going from one end to the other and then back down and then back up to the other end. And on the two legs of that length of coax, they had put ferrite beads. And that's what was inside the tube. So I thought I could make that. So I started off looking for ferrite beads that would be a tight fit on RG58. And I had to buy a pack of 20. They came from an industrial supplier in Birmingham. I can't remember the name of them, but it was about £15 to buy these, including the postage. When they arrived, I thought, do I need to put this in a tube? Can I not just leave the coax on its own? So that's what I did. I took a length of good quality RG58. Uh, this is Webro brand, which is what I've been using. The two best RG58s are Webro, which I think is a Dutch company, and Belden. And as you can see, I've just put the beads on here. And I thought I would make it slightly flexible by not putting them up against each other. But I found that when I put the heat shrink on, which has got adhesive on the inside of it, when I put it over and actually shrunk it down it is pretty solid it's got a bit of give in it but it's still pretty solid i've got a pl259 on each end one end goes into the back of the radio the other end goes into the back of my power meter 
or it has done, I don't use a power meter now. It has also gone into my antenna switch, but at the moment it's just got a coupler on it, it's going straight into the coax to the antenna. Since then, I found a cheaper supply of ferrite beads. They are not quite as bulky as these ones, but they were about three pounds for a hundred from AliExpress, and they're actually quite a soft mix. Um, so they're probably R-Type 43 or very close to it. I have a coax reel that I use when I operate portable and I've fitted two lots of 10 of them on that coax um, at the radio end and it's very effective indeed. So that's an option. Uh, they arrived packed in polystyrene to stop them being damaged in transit so it worked out quite well. And because I bought 100 I've still got about 80 left. That coax that you're seeing there is red and it's red because that was the cheapest way to get decent quality RG58. It's Belden RG58 in red at the time I was putting that reel together. So I hope you found that video useful and you could maybe build one or you could go out and buy one of course. But I ended up building one just simply because I had more control over what was in it and it fitted into my station a lot better because it was just like a patch lead. So thanks for watching and 73s from GM4SVM.